Hello, hello, everyone. Last time you saw us, we were doing wacky antics. Um, I was still drinking for sure. Uh, we were doing the vice feminism debate. Let's just do a round robin and introduce ourselves. My name is Blair Amani. Uh, I am an educator, author, very composed individual. I think as we all were for that wild moment. Um, and yeah, let's pass it off to Deja. Go ahead. My name is Deja Fox. And uh, this is the vice feminism debate. I withdrew from school, became the youngest staffer on any of the presidential campaigns and worked for Kamala Harris. Uh, and have since gone on uh, to serve as a social media director at Acronym, where I'm still working on this election and bringing it home. So if you can get out there and vote. I am Kate Robards and since the Vice panel, I have directed and developed three solo shows by three amazing New York artists, very different in scope and theme. I've performed my own show, um, was on the front page of the San Francisco Arts Chronicle, and have been doing stand-up until the pandemic kind of brought it to a halt. And Blair and I did America Did What, season one. Y'all can check that out. Hey everyone, it's your girl Nala Simone Toussaint. And since the Vice Feminist panel, I have been the executive director for Reuniting of African Descendants, which is a grassroots initiative that really supports the economical and well being of folks across the African diaspora with an urgent response to trans and queer people. Let's take it back. How did this thing come up? I thought I was getting interviewed by myself. <laughs> Not the case. I was late. Y'all remember I was late. I was the last person to get there. And then I asked immediately, are we allowed to cuss? And everybody was kind of like, who the fuck is this? Cussing. Um, and so that was fun. Uh, and I think I saw Nala, you had known my work. And then uh, I know Deja, because I used to write talking points for Deja back when she was a little baby when I worked at Planet. When I was a child, a literal child. <laughs> so what was it like for y'all when you found out about this opportunity? My story was kind of similar. Um, so it was finals season for me, um, and I had gotten an email, and I think it was framed as a Women's History Month panel. Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> and it was not expecting what I walked into. Okay, I think you had, you got through D-Nasty, who did the hosting? Yeah, so the host, Dee Nasty, is a stand-up comedian in New York City, and it was actually, like, I'd done some shows, and a lot of my material is, like, you know, I'm from a small town in Texas, and women where I'm from are, like, yes, I'm a feminist, all my guns are pink, and I'm, like, I don't know if that's it, ma'am. She'd heard that set, and I would, she was, like, hey, I'm doing a panel. It didn't occur to me that it was going to be filmed and watched. I thought it was, like, a live taping, because I do live shows, so in my mind, I was, like, oh, well, this is, like, an early on moment for me but I was like where's all the people like not thinking millions of people would watch it later I also thought it was a woman history panel so I'm like oh it's gonna be about policy I did not know it was gonna be a debate and the minute that I walked in and I started looking around that's when I was like oh I was already in a, a frame of resistance I'm like oh I'm looking around I'm like I already, I don't think there's anyone that's queer here. And then I saw you and I was like, <gasps> Yeah, I had no idea what was going on. I was confused though, because you were coming, you came up to me during the halfway point and you were like, they're not going to like what I have to say. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking everything queer is great. I'm like, are you a Republican? Like, what the heck? And then there was a surprise Black Republican, which they exist. That's what I'm saying. Like when I started seeing everyone around and like hearing the conversations that were happening, I was like, oh, they're not going to like what I have to say. I like I already in my head was like so if I was really being honest a piece of me felt like I shut down a little bit in the beginning I'm like mm -hmm. I don't like being in spaces where I feel like I have to defend for not only just rights that's necessary but for my identity and in in that moment sitting down like girl how much energy you want to be putting on this panel because honestly I really didn't know that this is going to be a panel like this like you know what I mean so I was and it was like a toxic environment I remember vividly there was somebody on set who was being transphobic to you yes. and like under the guise of I just want to know and it's like regardless and it wasn't somebody who worked at you know at the company that did the event but it was still very toxic and I I mean I, I like people are like how are you so composed Blair the audio technician came up to me they actually did a break 
because the producer was concerned that I was having a heart attack actively because my, you know, so folks who don't know, they have a mic. They usually put the mic right here for the bra strap, okay, right there. And so I'm talking and it's just like, I'm listening to this person. It was a joke for me and just boom, 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 boom. And so they like cut after that and they were like, do you need water? Are you okay? And back then my alcoholic self, I needed a drink, which is what I said right at the end of it. But they yes, were concerned. You did. And I remember now that makes sense why they cut in the beginning and, and we all separated and we came back. Totally makes sense now. Yeah, because they thought I was dying. When I saw Kate, I was like, but she can dress though. She's put together. She has a Southern accent, which threw me off. She's white. That threw me off. But I know the liberal South exists. You literally so was the plot State. twist. Literally a plot was twist. It was a plot switch. Not everyone was easy to, to pick out in the beginning. I was like, like she's, she's a Republican. <laughs> See, I said, literally, when I walked in, and it was because of Kate, where I was like, they're not going to like what I have to say. <laughs> and I gagged. I completely gagged. You were totally a plot twist. I feel like they separated all the BIPOC in different areas. Yes. It was wild. And like, I think the other thing that was really bonkers, I felt like, and I haven't said this publicly, I felt like there was a certain person where every time I brought up a point, that person rephrased my motherfucking point, and then their point got put on the clip. And I was like, okay. There were some folks like I had never thought of like a pro-life feminist existing. And Destiny, who was there, who was part of New Wave Feminist, I started talking to her afterward, and she paid for everybody's drinks, if you remember. Like, she was talking about how, like, no, you can be against these things, but it has to be within context. It's not about cutting off abortion rights if you're not funding contraception, if you're also funding the death penalty, if you're putting people in cages, if you're, you know, displacing folks. And I thought that was such a comprehensive, holistic view. I didn't even think that was in the rebel possibility. So I learned a lot of stuff. Uh, also learn uh, that, you know, Black Republicans exist. It's not something you learn, it's something you know. By a show of hands, who here voted for Trump? I don't publicize my votes, actually. I support Trump simply because he a businessman, and I come from a business family. I was raised, my dad was a single dad. He owned his own business. So, you know, who, who wouldn't want to vote for Trump? And so many folks were like, how could she do that? And like, the way I am, I'm not going to sit on TV in a film setting and go after one of my own sisters, you know? What I tell you, <laughs> I was sitting down and I felt like there was a level of comfort because I was sitting no. there. <laughs> so, so a little bit about why my facial reactions were the way they were, because I'm like, I literally was gagging the whole time. I, I was gagging to, to the point that I could not even think of what to say. We would get back to that comment that you know who made, but when she said who voted for Trump and I... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking like, I know she ain't my favorite. <laughs> the chick in the purple in front of me who was like, actually, I don't publicize my votes. And it's like, okay, cool. It's it. like, okay, let's move into questions. I'm so glad that you're sharing more because that was the biggest thing. Folks were like, Nala has to speak more. We have to hear from her. I don't care who you do a remix with, a reunion with. We have to have Nala. So let's yeah. talk questions. Okay. Ooh, maybe for Kate. Somebody clocked you, Kate. How do you deal, how do you talk to a family that deeply disagree with you, but do it in a productive way? I mean, that's a really hard one because as I'll use an example. So my brother is, um, he struggled with addiction like many people. He's been in and out of rehab, including state rehab, which is run by the privatized jail system. And he's a felon. And um, we had, were talking about felon rights and he was talking about, you know, that felons should have the right to vote, which in Texas they now do. And in many states, it is a hot button issue. He was like, if I, if, if yeah, I would vote for Trump. And at the time, last election, he could not. Now they've changed the laws, but I was like, you can't even vote, you're a felon. And he was like, yeah, that's wrong. And I'm like, so you do care about like prison rights. Like that is actually a very liberal mindset. So I try to get where I can at the issues by finding ways that they appeal, like that they personally appeal to people, you know? And that's like, that's my biggest in and it changes person by person, but it really is, a, you know, my Christian upbringing. It's like you, there's one sheep gone and you, you can keep the flock by itself, but go get that one sheep. It's like one person will make a difference. You know, and Blair, I thought your example earlier 
of what you can learn something because it's like I can also learn something too. And when we're just mad and think that we're so other, we can't actually compromise and hear each other out. So that's what I try to do. Deja, here's a great question. Um, when you started campaigning for Kamala Harris, a lot of folks had issues with it. <laughs> you recall, how do you feel now that you've been hailed as the youngest person to work on a presidential campaign? Well, I mean, that was true then and it's true now. Regardless of who I was working for, I was making strides for young people, right? I was taking up space and asserting that without a college degree and because of my perspective and my experiences, um, I was prepared to do that job and to do it well. Um, and by taking up space as a young person, by being a person of color, a woman of color, um, at such a high level of leadership, um, I think that that's a win. And that was true when I started and it was true when I finished, whether people wanted to write headlines about it then or later. I knew Kamala Harris was my candidate from the get-go and I didn't need other people to know it, right? She was raised by a single mom like me. She's a first generation American like me. She's a woman of color. She's been a first in so many rights. And like, that's me. I see myself in her and I was gonna fight hard for her regardless of if people liked it or not. When you make a decision and you do it wholeheartedly and you stick to your values, uh, and you know that you're making the best decision for you and your life, it doesn't really matter what other people think. Period. Speaking to what Nala was saying earlier about feeling like, am I the only queer person here? Like, what is up? There were folks who, they were asked a question about trans women. And then there were folks who decided to be transphobic in public and then be quiet about it afterwards. And I love how you did your little voice. You were like, somebody want to be bold, but they don't want to do it when they get caught up. You know, I can't remember what she said, but I was just like, go off. Um, by a show of hands, are trans women helping push forward uh, women's movement and gender equality? Well, I want to hear yes. that. Yes. <laughs> Wait, what? OK. For the people that disagreed, would you like to make a I thought I disagree. I thought people didn't raise their hands. But what was it like for you in that shift? Did, were you already kind of walking into that space knowing what it was like for folks to just disagree with your existence? I mean, on a, I'm going to just keep it real. On a day to day, I'm always, I know someone's always going to disagree, period. Like, and the thing about how I show up in spaces, whether passable or not, whatever that may look like, there are people who will literally make transphobic comments in front of me, not recognizing that I'm trans. So I've literally have heard the uh, plethora of disgusting trash bag kind of comments you can hear. And so in my mind, I literally have to breathe through every moment when I'm on a paddle. I don't need, I don't like if, if folks watch, I'm literally having my hand on my knee, on my legs, like, but gripping. I, I was doing the same thing. I was like. <laughs> I'm gripping because I'm like, if I, I need to feel like I'm grounded into something as I'm breathing, because I don't want to show people what they think of my community. Mm, that's a tough one. You know, like it, it's the thing where I'm allowed to feel my feelings. Right. But I've, also, I have to be, or I, I feel like, and it's a personal decision you have to make, right? Like, do I lean into wanting to disrupt their notions right. or do I feel my feelings? And I think that you did both at, you know, kind of simultaneously throughout right. the panel. Like there were points where you were like, y'all better speak, up, you know? And there are other points where you're just like, I'm gonna sit this one out. And I think that's really, it's really interesting. And it's also, you know, I think it's worth mentioning we spoke about how not everybody really knew what was up. And right. I think that there's such a push to create organic moments like this. And it's, it's harmful because like, you're not giving people the mental preparedness. Like had I known we were going to be on that type of panel, I would have taken additional anxiety medication. But I thought we were going into a one-on-one -on -one interview. And so I think that uh, it would behoove journalists, producers, et cetera, to really be intentional about how they're reaching out to talent and understanding two things. One, how it's going to affect the talent in the moment, but also how the visibility is going to take place. Because I think Deja and I, we both had viral moments before. So we were a little bit, you know, batting down the hatches, close your DMs, you know. Poor Kate was like, I'm a meme. What is this? <laughs> Like for me, yeah, that, that, for me, that I was not prepared. And I, and I, I want to echo something you said, like if had I had known, I would have prepared to like, because think about it, it's almost like being the only black person in this space, literally was the only trans person in this space. Yeah, trans queer, but how do you then sit in a space and feel like the weight of a community where like topics where y'all were talking about reproductive health, like I sat back because I was like, mm, that's not my, my experience might be different. 
I could have said so much more on that topic, particularly to what trans men or non-binary people who are able to have kids and what that struggle may look like that I know as a service provider. I could have said mm -hmm. so much more, but I kind of went to a place of this because I literally gagged. I gagged at every second and I'm like, whoa. And I think what threw me off was literally the BS that I heard, uh, particularly from this person about the joke of the voting, which- Should we- should we address that right now? So a big question that I think most folks are tuned in about, and the reason why this shit keeps haunting us every three months, exactly, is because a certain someone, who we will remain nameless because y'all already looked her up and everything else, decided to make a major decision that affects people's lives a joke. I, I don't know. I was in this, I literally sat in the voting booth for like, I, it was a long time. I honestly didn't even think he was going to win. So part of it was a kind of a joke. But but again, I, I again, I, I don't know. But well, I, I vote for speak to the privilege that that holds for that election to be a joke for you, right? Well, like, it wasn't really a joke. I was like, you, you know, just said it. <laughs> well, let me let me rec let me recant what I meant by a joke. You know. So there are so many different parts of this, y'all. And I just feel like what's laid out on the table, you know. Uh, first of all, what the fuck? Like, pff, bruh, fam, sib, sis, whole family, what the heck? I think that was the first time I have seen someone shit the bed on, t on camera. If I shit the bed, I mean, fuck up to sit the bed. Literally shit, shit the, the bed. bed and sat in it and, and was like, well, let me recant. No, and immediately bitch, we could smell it we could smell it you had to know it was so bad and so like the immediacy with which she decided to i did would like to unsay a rewind deja you were sitting next to the person i was sitting right behind them i the triangular stare i was just like that one is so funny to me really every time i see it like this I know, you could like follow it. It's so funny. In that moment, I decided that Kate was an ally. I'm gonna just look at Kate and hopefully decide in that moment, Kate, you down or not? What the fuck? And Kate was like, bitch, yes. What the fuck is this? And, and then I saw Nala. And if you zoom out in the picture, I looked at Nala. Nala looked at me. We all just looking at each other. Even the Trump supporting black woman was also shook. She was like, wait, you don't even have principles? It, did, it didn't make sense. I think <laughs> spirit for me was like what well, she said well you know because i like uh work with bernie sanders and i really like that took me out i was like i'm done i'm checked out cross my legs i'm out y'all can keep it <laughs> y'all can keep it for me i was like nope you you're not gonna okie doke me you're not gonna play it in my face first thing i want to say about this that a lot of folks were frustrated about so i want to name it is that this was definitely a misrepresentation of i think most Jewish folks, a lot of historically oppressed communities tend to vote in their best interests. And so to have two conservative Jewish women, they exist, of course, but I don't think it was representative of the mixture of folks that we had. So I would have loved to see a liberal Jewish person uh, that's more representative of the community speak as well. I was actually just going to add something about the like, I spent a lot of time thinking about like, why, 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 right? Like, me and her were about the same age. Right. And in that moment when she was talking about doing this community work for Bernie Sanders and then flipping sides and voting for Trump, it kind of hit something for me because I realized that I saw in her what I see in some young people that do this work, that they are not doing this because they're the most impacted. They're not doing this because they're affected. They're doing this to get ahead and they'll mm. get ahead in whichever lane they can. Right. So if they can get ahead in the Bernie Sanders lane, they'll work in the Bernie Sanders politics game. But if they can get ahead in the Trump lane, they'll, they'll work in the Trump lane. You know, it's wherever they can get ahead. And that, that's what makes me so upset is because, you know, someone like me who's working on these campaigns, to not be able to know if people are in it genuinely because they care, because they're really on your side, um, or if they would switch up when they got the opportunity to get ahead in a different lane, that's the kind of thing that makes me sick. And, and the record shows after, even after the panel, the record shows that this same person made a video stating that they were joking, that they were the plot twist. You know, I still got receipts. 
it was so offensive to me on many points beyond being a citizen who has a backbone and like, you know, a moral standing of like, what I do is serious. And I'm literally seriously in a position where I'm a professional joke writer and I've gotten to write jokes for Stacey no, Abrams, Kathy Griffin. not even a joke. I'm like, you're not even taking a joke seriously. You backtracked on your joke then, as Nala said, we, with the receipts, you're posting again about it being a joke. It's like, that's not a joke. I think to speak to what Deja just said about people who will do anything, I think she kind of thought it would make a splash and get her attention. And it one of the did, of, it showed it. But y'all are so like, I'm so inspired by y'all because it's like you get attention for the right cause, right? And it's like, you can use that. Y'all are examples that you can use your platform to really educate people. I'm still trying to get to 10,000 so I can swipe up to give people resources. We're going to y'all, you hear that, Smarties? <laughs> you like, hear that? Follow Nala. I'm like, I don't understand. Also, call to action. Every time I see that video pop up on a different platform, I'm like, I tag all of us. And I'm like, I was can almost I asking, I was like, like, please hit that comment. Thank you. I don't know. Have y'all ever gotten spotted? Like, what's been the, the wildest thing that's happened in your personal life or career based on this? Because I know for you, Nala, like, you were not so in front of the scenes prior to this video. What was that like? Yeah, it was a, it was a big shift. I think what's, what's so interesting, because around that time, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it was around February. Yeah. So, and if anyone knows, that's when legislation session starts. So I did the panel, and then I had to go to DC with like some other advocates to fight for issues and meet with council members and stuff. And at the minute I walked in, there were people coming my way and people giving the face with. Wait, are you that girl on the? I just watched it this morning. Oh my gosh, you did such a great job. And it was like, I was like. It, it was weird. It was so weird. It was so weird because I, I hadn't had that experience. I Most of my existence has literally just been about surviving. I'm going to keep it real with you. Like a lot of my existence is like, if I can make it to point A to point B and then back, I did something good. So to be at a space where people are able to spot you gives anxiety because it's also attached to safety, right? It's mm -hmm. also uh, attached to vulnerability. And we still live in a country where my very existence there is no a policy that affirm my blackness or or me as my as being trans or even as queer. And so when I think about all of those things, I'm like, I just gave myself freely. I was on the phone with Deja. I was on the phone with Kay. I think I was on the phone with you too about like safety and protocols and how to move forward. Um, but it is very jarring. You're being, you know, uh, you're being spotted. You're being clocked. Like all types of different things. Um, and so Deja, I want to talk to you. So for those who don't know, let's roll the tape. Let's roll the tape about the time that Deja handed this man's ass to him. Jeff Flake, my name is Deja Fox and I'm a 16 year old from Tucson. I just want to state some facts. Um, so I'm a young woman and you're a middle-aged man. I'm a person of Ouch. color and you're white. Um, I come from a background of poverty and I didn't always have parents to guide me through life. You come from privilege. So I'm wondering, as a Planned Parenthood patient and someone who relies on Title X, who you are clearly not, why it's your right to take away my right to choose Planned Parenthood and to choose no copay birth control to access that. So if you can explain that to me, I would appreciate it. I've had a lot of advantages that others haven't. And that what I want is to make sure that everyone can realize the American dream that all of us have been successful at. And if no so, copay birth control is helping me to be successful, to reach for higher education, and Planned Parenthood is doing that as well, why would you deny me the American dream? <laughs> so Deja, you are so young. You, uh, Planned Parenthood advocate, spoke truth to power. Uh, very publicly. I worked at Planned Parenthood at the time, y'all. It was great. Planned Parenthood Federation of America. This tape came in from us from our Arizona folks, and immediately they were like, we need to media train her. We need to prep her. Not because we need to control what she has to say, but let's prepare her accordingly. How did that differ from this time, this, this round of virality? We also have to remember that 2016, 2017, when that went viral, the internet looked very different. Even also, how old were you when that happened? Of, I was 16 when that happened. Um, I was a baby. 
and like I was still working at the gas station I was in high school right like I was dealing with some real ass shit like living with my boyfriend things were hard and to throw being viral having 18 million eyes on me and ears on a story that is deeply personal was hard but I had someone in my corner right like I had the Planned Parenthood team to have my back they made sure, you know, I had already gotten trainings on media triangles and power mapping and the story of self. Like I'm really throwing them out there because they mattered. They made the difference in how I was able to create a moment, to frame my narrative, to fit, right? To like both be authentic to me and to meet the moment and to meet the media cycle, right? And to create the kind of buzz that then gets traction to change policy and move policy makers. Um, and so I already, I had this like, really vast understanding of things that they do not teach you in school. I had all these trainings. I had a team behind me to help me and support me. Um, but going viral that first time, it didn't prepare me to go viral the second time. It actually just, when I went viral the second time with you all, it was like a trauma response mm -hmm. of having so many eyes on me. And I couldn't go to class. I didn't eat. I couldn't go to the dining halls because I felt like everyone was staring at me. Like I was crying in my room for days. And in some ways, I remember my counselor or my, uh, my advisor at school saying, but isn't this what you want? Why don't you just delete Twitter? And I was like, it's not that simple. Okay, let's demystify that for folks right now. Why don't you just to get off social media? Why don't you just do this? Like whatever. When you are viewed in a certain way, the human psyche, we are not equipped to deal with people saying all types of incorrect things about us and for us to have to be fine with that and then turn it off because those opinions in the ether still exist and it's very detrimental to the mental health. I had a mental breakdown around Twitter, you know, like it was very problematic. It completely changes your whole, your whole view of your own self-worth. So we have to have really necessary and honest conversations about what it does to people and not be flippant and gaslighting by saying just get rid of it um that said with people thinking that you're one thing and you're actually another i'm gonna take it to kate kate what was it like for you for people to like for like you know we just talked right here we were like she's a republican and for folks to see it was it affirming were you frustrated that folks were like kind of erasing this idea of a uh, progressive south what what was going through your mind talk about what it was like in kate land I like to think of myself as a marginally employed, you know, artist who I incorporate, you know, growing up on the poverty line with a single mom and addiction, like in all of these themes and hating people and learn, like learning to love people. I incorporate that into my daily life and into my work as a comedian, into my work as a playwright. But I never expect it to reach an audience because of the way I look. I've had people, ex you know, think that I was the one who went to Columbia, Deja. Like I went to a community college in Orange, Texas, and I waited tables and I, you know, had a hardship license when I was in high school. So it's the opposite, where it's like people immediately feel safe around me. But I, you know, and and in my training and Blair, you know that I've been an active member of um, Middle Collegiate Church and I've done anti-racism training. Let me say, y'all. When Kate, I was on the fence. So I was like, okay, she's not a violent white person. We love it. Okay, cool. She's fashionable. Also love that. We could go shopping together. Uh, and then when I was like, you know, she was talking about being a woman face. She's like, I go to middle collegiate with Jackie Lewis. I was like, Reverend Jackie Lewis, Dr. Reverend Jackie Lewis. Yes. You're good. You're good in my book because I know that you have done the work. And that's why I was so happy to work with you on the anti-racism education with America Did What. But for me, I was just excited to find a platform that's not a room of people. And it's, it's fun for me to engage. And I do respond to DMs. And I love to listen. And I love, you know, I wouldn't have known about Nala. So it's, it's I personally, like, I like to have these conversations. And I'm not afraid of what I believe in. I stand for them. Having that opportunity to engage with an audience is amazing for me. Beautiful. So a big question that we've gotten is a very serious one about Amy Cone Coney Barrett. Oh, you got it. It's Amy Coney yeah. Barrett. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, she is grossly underqualified and biased and uh, period. So reproductive health is on the line. The thing that's been frustrating for me, you know, when I worked at Planned Parenthood, I was working in the Southern States. I was working with folks who were already living in a pre-Roe existence. That means that Roe versus Wade 
never really meant anything for them because it was never enacted in an equitable manner, not even to consider folks who are erased because of the gender binary, who also deserve access to reproductive health, uh, not to even in talking about folks who've been erased because of the sex binary, who are intersex, who have, you know, various different chromosomal variations who aren't even discussed. So there's been a lot of folks who are already in peril as it relates to reproductive health. And I think that was one thing that united us is uh, like, you know, when we talk about things like abortion, it's not taboo. It's not like, oh my goodness. It's like, no, let's talk about it. But let's talk about it comprehensively. Let's not talk about it in a cis sexist way. Let's not talk about it in this like linear way. And a lot of folks are freaking out justifiably because we have a conservative leaning court but then you also have folks who are like, you know, in my community, especially historians who are kind of like, this court never really cared about us. And the only times it has cared about us is when there's been immense social pressure for them to care about us. So what do we say to these folks? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm gonna, I, I feel like I wanna speak from the heart. I think the lack, well, you can't really expect anything from our current administration, right? The fact that RBG died during a pandemic and the very, quick response that we have is to replace that position without empathy, without thought, without a rest in peace, without actually thinking about the integrity of who she was, who was once in that seat, right? There was no thought into that. The only thought was that we need to replace this and we have to make sure that it is, in case we lose our seat, in case we lose this presidential, we have someone who is there for us. Yeah, I just think, again, I think just trying to put someone in office after RPG died during a pandemic, I think as administration, the focus should have been on how are we keeping people safe, right? I think we have yet to address the homeless population that on the street, right? I think when we think about a pandemic in itself, I, you know, I live in Jersey, but I also travel back to New York. I have yet seen any infrastructure that actually creates something that keeps people are experiencing homelessness safe. So to here we are to put Amy in office, right? At this time is literally around them covering their behinds, point blank period, that's how I feel. I mean, there are other people who are in the Supreme, the, who sit in the Supreme Court, I forget her name, who do so-, so Huh? Yeah, Sonia Sotomayor. Yes, who do so many amazing works. So I don't want to take that away. I think it's important to think about some, the all women across the identity spectrum who haven't had a chance to uh, really have someone who represents them. Um, I could go on and on. I just feel like it's just bullshit. Women who are in positions of power but don't give a shit about anybody are not wins for feminism. Exactly. And it's some bullshit, like you said, Nala. She had two years served as a judge. And just show me how that deals with qualifications. And then, you know, we look at our president, though, and what priors did he have with politics? So I'm not shocked, but it is a dire situation for healthcare. You know, I want to uplift something Blair said about the fact that there are folks in this country who are already, uh, who have already been denied their right to choice, their right to abortion, right? And in some ways, I keep hearing people say, like, we need a judge who's going to look out for women's rights, women's issues, right? Who are going to stand up for women, who are going to act in the best interest of women. In some ways, like, I kind of look at it and I think Amy Coney Barrett is in a lot of ways acting in the best interest of other rich white women. She is. She, she is going to create a world in which they can continue to be successful when the rest of us are here struggling to get ahead. Uh, I'm 20 years old, right? I didn't get to vote in the 2016 election, uh, so I had no say in this president. This president did not win the popular vote anyway, and then he's appointed this justice who is going to sit on that court, likely until I can run for president and even longer, right? When I step up to run in 2036, when I step into the Oval Office, she's still going to be holding her seat on the court, and that, that is a really interesting perspective for me to think about because it just shows how if someone could vote as a joke for that president, the long lasting implications of that, the lifetime implications, right? The implications that will have on my children whose lives will still be affected by the decisions that that woman is making. There's something inherently wrong about that. We have seen our democracy be challenged and degraded time and time again. And they're standing here questioning like, how is this happening? Is this right? Is this even, are we even on the right path? Is there saving this? Like, 
what do we do? How do we move forward? Um, and the thing that I have to, you know, kind of leave with is this election, getting out the vote is just step one. We need to get Trump out of office. That's the first step. But I need people to know that this doesn't end on November 3rd, right? Like we need to keep renewing our commitment to this work because Amy Coney Barrett is going to be there for a lifetime. And we're going to have to keep fighting. That's just it. You know, I'm going to have to keep fighting. You're going to have to keep fighting. And there's no getting around it because people voted like it was a joke four years ago. And now we have a lifetime of work ahead of us. Whether you so, vote or not, you're going to be impacted. So I just think about people who have the, and this is just really a heart to heart, if you have the ability to vote, if you have the ability to step in for a vote for someone who does not have the privilege to vote, if you have the ability to do something for someone else, why not do it? Yeah. So y'all know we weren't actors. We are real people. Um, historians, yeah. activists, communications professionals, comedians, writers, uh, folks who have authentic things to say. And it's just been great to continually have y'all in my life. Um, you never know what's going to happen when you go to these types of things, especially when you don't know what you're going into. But yeah. if there's one thing we can all learn, it's not to treat voting like a joke. Vote for justice, vote for righteousness, um, and let's continue to build a better world.